So I'm going to anticipate having shown you slides, and two of the things I, I wanted to show you are two new instruments that we built, uh, but I'm not going to be able to show them to you. So you're going to have to imagine them. Uh, one of the things that changed our direction in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome research was a collaboration with this company called Metabolon. Um, I was a consultant for Thermal, Fa uh, Thermal Fisher, who makes mass spectrometers, and I met someone from a new company called Metabolon who was interested in the Thermal Fisher instruments. And uh, through that effort and them setting up a whole uh, bank of these instruments, to do metabolomics, that is measure all the metabolites. Now, there's probably about 4,000 metabolites in your blood, in your, and uh, maybe something like half of those are actually coming from the bacteria that are in your gut. So you see both of them. Uh, what Metabolon had to do is write a lot of software to be able to handle all this data and identify what they were looking at, and that took quite a bit of time. But I asked them as soon as they were ready to do my son. And so they did give me a call about two years ago, said we are ready to try it. We're not totally functional yet. So I sent them blood samples. Uh, they did do it. It took them a long time. Uh, they spent somewhere between twenty and $50,000 of their own money analyzing uh, his blood. It was the first patient they, that they had had. Uh, they came, in fact, the CEO flew out to Palo Alto, they, they were in uh, North Carolina, with a team and to show me what they had found. And I took one look at it, and it took me five seconds. <laughs> the mitochondria, because <laughs> you look at all the metabolites, the citric acid cycle was really depleted, and, and everything else seemed to stem from that. And you can also look at it saying, well, this person's not really burning glucose very well, which is what you're supposed to do. And when tracking it back to, that's what I want to show you, the whole pathway, but it's, you can just imagine it. It's a horrendous pathway of all the, everything that goes on in the body. The, the glucose looked like it was being shunted over to, uh, uh, to, to, to make fatty acids. So there's a pathway called the sorbitol pathway. Uh, it goes to fructose which is why you don't want to eat a lot of fructose, because fructose can easily get converted into fatty acids. So it looked like the cells were storing fatty acids. It wasn't even clear that they were able to burn fatty acids very well from looking at the metabolism. Uh, it did look like they were probably burning some amino acids, and we heard a talk this morning that talked a lot about that, and that was right on, exactly what we saw. Now, because my son is very ill, um, I've been trying to do this on fast track, which means I don't take a lot of time to go publish something. As long as somebody else is doing it, I don't need to publish it. So it, about that time, I, I learned about uh, Robert Navio who was working on the metabolomics, and I said, he's an expert in mass spectrometry, he's an expert in metabolism, let him do it. I, I do not need to compete with him, I'll just talk with him. And we had a, I had a great relationship from then on, but we're not competing but I would then like to do what is the next step. And he was looking for a biomarker. So uh, also I wanted to try to figure out something that we can use uh, to analyze individuals. And the other thing, which I was also going to talk about a little bit, was we, we launched with uh, Open Medicine Foundation uh, a big data study uh, looking at severely ill patients. Uh, all the samples have been collected for that study. They're in process. It's, it's way too complicated to try to talk in a short period of time, and it's certainly impossible to do it without slides. So I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, uh, but we'll ha we have a lot of data. 
So we have a tremendous amount of, uh, of data and things we've analyzed on a small number of patients. A lot of physicians say, well, we're only doing 20 patients, way too small number. We're spending one and a half million dollars on 20 patients. And so the idea here is, and yes, we'll have a lot of false discovery. I think we can handle that. Uh, what you do with this is look at where the, where the most likely things are that are going wrong and, and so forth to, to do the next study. So what a lot of people do is look at one thing and ignore everything else. We have no idea what you're ignoring. We need to know what we're ignoring. So we're going to do everything to try to figure out what is the most likely information, and now you can take that, reduce the amount of data you collect, and do it on a large number of patients. And that's the strategy. What I'd like to do is a large number of patients with a lot of number of data, and all I would need is probably $40, $50 million. <laughs> so if, if anybody's... Anybody's... <laughs> so I it, it, so it, it, it is a compromise. But it's a compromise that we have to make sometimes with that money. Yes. Uh, he, studied, uh, he said he was doing that a lot of metabolomic studies and also using 23andMe as a source for SNP data on mitochondrial regulation or mitochondrial pathways. And they failed to find anything but one, what was the one you found? Haplogroup H. Haplogroup H. Haplogroup H is, which More is in the 23andMe in the, in the mitochondrial DNA. Genotype, uh, oh, genotype, and also there's maybe a double the, the normal amount of no calls in the 23 and ME, very significant increase uh, in just a small number of patients. So 25 over 25. So that to me says to me an oxidative damage. Which well, it could be. Uh, uh, we have, we, we've done the mitochondrial sequencing. We've done a lot of mitochondrial DNA sequencing. Right now, we have a technology that allows us to do a multiplex amplification of the mitochondrial DNA and get rid of everything else. So it's a single tube assay, and it goes to the sequencer. So we can do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mitochondrial DNA this way. And we've done the same thing with the viruses. So we do one amplification and amplifies all the herpes viruses and everything else that's been associated with chronic fatigue syndrome that's only a single tube assay, and then it runs to the sequencer. So, um, We'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll see that if it's there, and we should look very carefully for it. Yeah. And also, the, uh, with how Navio does it, it isn't the same as how Metabolon has done it. We see that differences as well. And now we're working with Metabolon and Bob Navio to make sure we have a protocol that's very reproducible. Uh, and, we, and we need to involve. Say, Ron, I have yeah. a question for you. Yes. Um, given that uh, there's so much uh, data pointing to mitochondrial dysfunction, um, but nobody really in MECFS are doing any mitochondrial genetic testing on their clinic patients. Do you think or do you recommend that clinicians should be sending people with MECFS for mitochondrial genetic testing? Uh, at the moment, no. And so, uh, of our, so far with our 20 patients, I don't think they have a lot of care. We work also work with great hands and he's a mitochondrial genetics, human mitochondrial genetics disease expert. We've worked with him about five or six years. We've done a lot of sequencing for him. Uh, we sequence both uh, mitochondrial DNA, but more likely there is nuclear mutations and we look at those as well. And we've set up a whole, uh, there's sort of almost a whole institute there for doing that kind of genetics. So I have a fair amount of experience in, in doing that. It's hard. Uh, it's hard to find uh, a nuclear mutation. Uh, it's easy to miss them. So, uh, so, uh, so, the, so we know that maybe something is involving in the mitochondria, so we try to develop two different instruments to try to help us out a little bit. One of them is the seeing that it looks like uh, uh, the glucose is being shunted to fatty acids. So we built an instrument that uh, was, was put on top of the iPhone, so the, the nice thing about these phones, uh, Android, but it doesn't matter. We use an iPhone. Uh, they have really good cameras. And so we make an instrument that attaches to the camera of the phone. The most expensive part of the instrument is the phone. Uh, um, we also build a new sequencer, uh, and that's made with Genaptis, and, uh, and the computer that runs the sequencer is a phone. Because uh, it's the cheapest thing you can put into it. So that sequencer we're hoping to sell for $1,000. Cool. 
Uh, anyway, we built an instrument here. It has a permanent magnet in it, and it uses a magnetic fluid, and it, and it separates out cells based on magnetic levitation. So it will separate out all, it's like a, a very cheap cell sorter. It'll separate out all of the different cell types, uh, and it does it in a capillary little tube that sits here on the, on the phone. And the phone then can look at it. You can, you can magnify the, at what you're looking NASA at. NASA would have paid you for that. What's that? <laughs> NASA would have paid you for that. They're always looking for a little lightweight system. So the, the, the only thing that's disposable now is a sort of blast tube. The assay costs five cents. Uh, and you can see the results in about 20 minutes. Wow. Uh, right. So uh, what we can see in that is if we do something that kills the cell, uh, it will change density. So if we put a tumor cell in it, or take blood that has circulating tumor cells, put it in the device, we can see the tumor cells, we add an anti-tumor agent, and we look for a density change in those cells. So if there is a density change, the, the anti-tumor agent is working. If there isn't, we know that tumor agent does not work, and you need to go get a different one. Uh, we've also seen the same thing with, the, with bacteria and so forth. You can do the same. You can see that. <coughs> the, the nice thing about all the optics that are kind of new generation of optics, uh, you can see bacteria there. In fact, you can magnify things in the phone that allows you to go down to atomic resolution. <laughs> and it's using a lot of tricks um, beyond me. <laughs> but well, it's, it's phenomenal for, for an instrument. For lots of instruments are going to come that will be attaching to, to the phone. We're going to open it up to more questions. Uh, I have a question. Yes, yes. I have one more instrument. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is an important one. So, the second instrument we built is based on uh, electrical impedance, and this is made by an electrical engineer. And what we've noted <laughs> is that if a cell starts to die, its electrical impedance will change. So what we've done, well, what we want to do is to build an assay that uses cells that show the behavior of chronic fatigue syndrome. If we can do that, we can test drugs. And that's what we're going at. So if to normal do drugs, the hardest way to do drugs is to test them on people. It takes several years and millions of dollars. The second way you can do it is to develop an animal model. And an animal model is much cheaper, but still takes a fairly length of time. You can also do it on cells if they show the behavior. And that's by far the cheapest and fastest way. So if we can actually look at cells, we can test every drug that's ever been approved by the FDA probably in one or two years. Wow. So this is looking at water content per cell, that the lipid content of the cell, and, and uh, cell volume. Is that how well, it, 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 it is? In this case, we're, we're just simply measuring impedance. That's bioimpedance yeah. around the cell and through the cell. Yeah. yeah. So the device is this a, uh, it is a, 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 this is all made by nanofabrication. Stanford has a very good nanofabrication facility. Uh, and so uh, Stanford can go down to 18 nanometer resolution and fabrication. So we, what we do is build a channel that will, fit, that will accommodate the cell. And then we build uh, electrodes that go into that channel. Uh, and we do 2,500 electrodes in, in this channel coming in from both sides. And then we take measurements 100 times a second. So that doesn't mean that when the cell moves around, we average it all, you don't even see that. And so this will measure impedance, and I'll show you, this is the instrument. <laughs> if you can see it. It's pretty cool. I'm it's, telling it's you, NASA's going to pay So this off. is the instrument, <laughs> and uh, 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 we're now having, this is a defective chip. That's why I have to wire it around with it. Um, but what happens, and I, that's why I want to show you the data, but I can't. Um, if you put healthy cells on it, they have a constant impedance for a very long time. There's no problem. If you put chronic fatigue syndrome cells on, you put them on, they give you exactly the same impedance for a long time. Which kind of cell do you put on the uh, white cells? White cells, I'm sorry. Yeah, that would have been on the slide. <laughs> yeah, so, but it's, it's, uh, it's the total. We're not separating cells. We do remove the red cells. And the reason we move the red cells is we get a, 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 the opposite effect in, in the red cells. And I don't, I don't, it's, red cells usually use glycolysis. So the red cells uh, give us a change in, the opposite change in impedance and kind of mask everything. 
So we separate out them from the, the white cells. This assay might work on the red cell themselves, but we'd like to do the white cells. So you put the white cells in, and, and it has the same level of impedance. Now, we go back to the healthy cells and put them on, and now we stress them. We make a demand for the consumption of ATP. They don't change. We put the chronic fatigue syndrome cells on and make a demand for ATP. And we get a, in about two hours, we get a major <coughs> increase in impedance. Very reproducible. That's an asset. And it could be scaled up. So effectively, what I'm, this is the way to think about it. It's not probably the right kind of description. But it's effectively like seeing uh, the post-exertional malaise at the cellular level. Where in development is that test? At what stage of development is that Well, test? the problem is, it's easy for me to do this. I, 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 and we'll have all the information for other people to do it, but you don't have to have a lot of engineering. Okay. But I, what I hope would be is that this is probably way more sophisticated than you need. The next stage is to be clever about it and figure out a way to do it that's easy. This is hard. How do you we'll exercise, continue to pursue this because we can. How do you exercise a white cell, first of all? Um, how do you stress it? Well, in a sense, we're exercising. Well, the, the one we have tried is we simply add sodium chloride. Okay. And that ha they well, have to turn the pumps on well, to yeah. pump out the sodium. Again, this is something new. We mean something wrong to be a total artifact. Mm. If we have to take that into consideration. But the, the concept here is to try to talk about stuff that's happening in the lab and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully it's right, but this is how, the, the, I live in Silicon Valley, right? mm -hmm. and, and it has a huge impact on how you think about things, and you don't do anything that's obvious. Um, I'd right. like to you always do things that are not obvious, but in fact if they work, they'd be great. Yeah, that's the question.